the out pieces and which location they chose to put the artwork. I will only say that five pieces will be here, which means people can visit the library and then get a map and tour, just take a walk on a nice early spring day and see the artwork around the Civic Center. Um, two pieces will be presented and, and the DIA love the location. One is at Inglenook Park and one is at Beachwood. And the idea was also to choose, they love the idea to present it in a park where we know Inglenook Park is very busy, Beachwood is very busy, we have the golf course there. But the whole idea when people come to the play lot at Inglenook on the weekend it's very busy <coughs> with family and kids, they will uh, be able to see the artwork there. Um, again, the whole idea is artwork, promoting the DIA, promoting the masterpieces from their collection, and uh, reach out to the metro Detroit area, reach out to communities around Detroit to bring people to the DIA. Uh, this is basically uh, my introduction, and I will invite uh, Michelle Housky to present uh, the audit. Thank you. Um, again, my name is Michelle. I work at the Detroit Institute of Arts. I'm actually the coordinator of Inside Out. Um, and I just want to give you a quick background on the program. The museum celebrated a 125 year anniversary, and as part of that anniversary, we wanted to connect with the community. Our main goal is to help people deepen their appreciation with art. So we partnered with a board member. We reproduced paintings and put them throughout communities for a three month installation. They loved it. So because of that, we started to, we decided to repeat the program. This will be the third year that Inside Out is taking place. We'll have 80 paintings, uh, 80 reproductions of work from the museum's collection spread out throughout 11 cities this spring, and we'd like to invite the city of Southfield to participate. So we're bringing 80 reproductions to parks, metro areas, um, as part of a way to connect with our work. Okay, so think of it like a traveling exhibition. So this spring, from April through June, we'll have 80 paintings in 11 cities. Those 80 paintings will then rotate to a lot of new communities this summer, uh, and they come down. So it's like a, we're trying to to, uh, to to delight people and to bring reproductions to you. Um, each painting is waterproof, it's on vinyl, uh, it's framed in a real frame, it's been weather treated, they're true to size. They have a label that connects, that tells what the artwork and connects it to the legacy of the DIA in Michigan's history. Um, there's also <coughs> going to be a printed, a custom map. So as you're going on tour, you can <coughs> walk around and take this map. Everything will be uh, available online. There will be a master map that shows you which other communities are participating along with you. We're also going to have our own Facebook site, our own blog, going to be promoted through uh, social media and through printed materials. And we're offering uh, a designated free day for <coughs> residents of Southfield to come and see the real pieces in person. So we'll give you a free Sunday, show a driver's license, you get four free admissions, we'll have maps that then show you where your pieces are located in the museum. Uh, we're going to do two types of installation. We have a wall-mounted installation and a freestanding installation. Uh, wall-mounted, they're going to go through the, we, first of all, we contract with a licensed sign contractor, actually a contractor from Southfield. Uh, they're, um, they're insured. We also carry liability insurance um, for building mounts. They go into the mortar of the wall, and then we, cut a, we create a custom aluminum shelf that the painting sits on and then we have secure hardware that actually connects the painting to the wall. Um, so here's a diagram. And then freestanding reproductions are installed on a post that's driven 25 inches into the ground. Um, when the painting is, when the, when the installation is done, they pull the post out and they just fill the space. So there's very, um, there's no remediation. Um, but again, the DIA is going to cover the entire cost of the exhibition. We actually have funding, we have grants from the uh, Knight Foundation, 
uh, who are going to fund this program for the next two years, they love to fund random acts of culture. So they're looking at this as a way to, um, alongside with the artwork, we're going to have programming and events, and so the night foundation has agreed to come on board with this program. Um, should there be any damage to the works, the museum will come out and replace them. The city is not liable for uh, theft or vandalism. There's no cost, and again, it's insured. So the, the program is completely free. Um, this is a, I mentioned a few uh, past installations. So in 2011, we were in 22 cities uh, in six different counties from June through December, uh, Birmingham being one of them. Uh, this is a, a sample wall installation in Howell. Um, so you can see uh, they're doing this to painting. And then this is a sample freestanding uh, installation in Milford, at uh, Mill Pond. Um, so you can see it's on fence posts. There's also a map holder, so if you happen to walk by, you can pull out a map. Um, and the whole point of this, or, or an outcome that we're hoping, is the surprise and delight. And something that we didn't expect, communities have really started to show pride in their own locations by putting these pieces in areas that you feel um, that are important to you. You know, communities are starting to, residents are starting to look at their area again and say, wow, I really, really like coming here, or this is a great location. Um, and so, you know, the artwork at the museum belongs to everybody. We just have to be located in Detroit. This program helps share that artwork with everybody. So if you can't make it down to the VIA, then you can enjoy these pieces in places that are, that are meaningful to you and that are comfortable to you. Um, and, and we like that environment. So, proposed locations, the library, um, the entrance to the library, and we would like to play uh, a Benny Andrews, which is a contemporary artist. This is a portrait of a collage, collages. Uh, it would be wall mounted to the entryway of the uh, uh, library. Um, we like to put one at the Memorial Gardens and the Civic Center, which is just outside. This is a uh, Dutch work. It's a portrait of Sophia. And I know that the Parks and Recreation, uh, so we're also hoping to do programs and events, not just bring you artwork and have the maps, but actually team up with the library and the Parks and Recreation Department actually bring uh, custom tours and events that help you connect on another level. So um, I signed Sophia because I know that you have a princess and superhero uh, events with Parks and Recreation while this is on, so I thought that was a nice connection. Um, another idea could be either the other side of the Memorial Gardens or the entrance to City Hall. Um, this is an English uh, painting. It's called uh, View Stands at Sunset. Um, And then another idea was to probably put it in the lawn with uh, the picturesque, um, the towers in the background. So we think a photo opportunity to have this great work of art with Southfield Towers in the back. And we'd like to place the Canaletto there. Um, this is the Piazza San Marco. Um, as you can imagine, a freestanding painting with the towers in the background. And then uh, Beachwood Recreation Center. Again, we're looking for delight and surprise. We're putting these in places like recreation centers, dog parks, bike trails, places that people would not imagine stumbling upon a great masterpiece. So we're really excited about places like parks and this recreation center. This would be wall mounted. Um, I'd like to give you Celadon and Amelia, which was actually in the it was in the image that I showed you earlier at the Howell Opera House. So you can actually see um, see it as it was reproduced and mounted to the wall. Uh, we're also considering the entrance to the Parks and Recreation area. So it's a very busy location. It's in the Civic Center. It would also be wall mounted. I'd like to give you the Nut Gatherers, um, which is one of our most popular paintings in the museum. Um, it's one of the most frequently visited. Uh, it's a Bougaro. It's a really nice work of art. And then we also were looking at Inglenook Park. Um, so you put it in front of the place gate or in front of the barn. Uh, and, and the piece is a Reginald Marsh, 
which is a modern work. It's called The Boy Ballroom. It's very active and engaging. Children love it. It's really popular on our tours. So looking at our calendar, um, we're hoping to do the installations toward the end of March. Your works of art would be on display April, May, and they come down at the end of June and they rotate to new communities. So I just want to give you a kind of a timeline of when your works would be. I believe the free Sunday is in May that we've indicated for Southfield residents, but I have that written down. Um, and if there's anybody have any questions for me. I'm sorry? Are they for sale? Oh, are they are they for sale? Uh, some of the some of the prints we actually our, our board member has a company called Smart Editions and he has he has made smaller versions of the prints available. Um, the reproductions themselves are not because we need them to continue to do uh, the installations through our grant for the next two years. But if you're interested I can tell you how we made them. So. <laughs> Anything else? Um, yeah, I just have a question. Is, is, is it as if you go to a museum, there's kind of a plaque next to it that explains yeah. it, or is it all is it next to the painting, yeah. or is that all in the pamphlet? It's attached. We'll go back. And it's hard to see. Sorry, I should have given you a close up of it. Um, we have a plaque that that lists the night oh uh, the night foundation. It lists the work of art. It lists the title, and then it gives a, a brief description about the work of art and the program itself. It will tell you that um, there are more pieces available and it's going to direct you to our website. So our website, is gonna, we're actually going to have, a, we're gonna have a, an inside out link, so it would be DIA uh, slash inside out that you can, it'll take you to and you can learn about, you can learn about, um, learn to see the see a map, see a map, and learn about where your pieces are. You can download the maps from the website as well. Um, we're hoping to do a smartphone app, but I don't know if it'll be produced in time, but. Um, oh, you can't see it. Okay. Um, okay. So, there's the button. Yeah, sorry. It's hard to see. Um, it's a waterproof plaque that will attach to all of the artwork. So if it's freestanding, it attaches to the side, and the wall mounted, it's going to be on the same side. And then if it's freestanding, there'll be a, a plastic container with the fold out walking map. And does, it, does that map include the date of that Sunday? Yes, it will. Okay. Yeah. It will. We'll include your free Sunday. We're also doing things like photo contests for we'll, we we'll hope to award memberships. Um, we want we want people to engage and have fun with it. So we're hoping to have Flickr photo contests where you can upload photos yourself or creative images and we'll have um, categories and we'll award memberships or free tickets. Uh, we're doing a geocaching which is a treasure hunting game. It's really popular with smartphones. Um, you download a GPS, you uh, basically seek out my coordinates, and then there's a cache that actually has prizes in it that will fill free tickets to the <coughs> film theaters, stickers, um, as a way to, to get people involved. We're also wanting to do, um, you know, each each city is doing its own kind of programming, so we're, and we're in communication trying to come up with different events like uh, art making workshops or a tour that on um, maybe starts the library and actually we send you a docent and do a guided tour. Um, other communities we've organized bike trail or bike bike tours. We've organized dog walking tours where people actually walk their pets with the docent and they, they they're outside and they're experiencing um, you know, paintings with their dog. Or we've actually had candlelight tours with flashlights and there's a full moon. Um, we're just trying to make this fun and creative. So there are a bunch of uh, we're still coming up with the programs for Southfield. But, um, <coughs> I really like this idea of random acts of culture that kind of expands up on a conversation we had at the table a couple weeks ago. So. We actually had, in in Detroit, we had the pieces installed along the riverfront with the Quinnipiac Eastern Market. So we put together a bicycle tour that started at the museum. Um, we toured people down to the riverfront and we had random acts of culture along with their works of art. So we had a, a high school group do a poetry performance in response to one of the paintings. We had a, a Baroque concert in the Quindicott. We had a, uh, like a cooking demonstration in the Easter Market and then we ended at the museum with the unveiling of the Detroit Reveal Photography exhibit. So it was really kind of a way to, not, not just the BIA, not just the works of art, but to appreciate Detroit. And that's kind of how how we're trying to focus this program is to make things relevant to your city, 
to find places that you find relevant and important to you and help tie that back to your community. It's kind of, kind of what we're going for. It's all about community and sort of pride and, and ownership. It's something that we really, um, an outcome that we didn't expect. You know, uh, people come into the museum and say, that's my painting. And it's really great because, in a sense, it is everybody's painting. Um, so, any other questions? Um, <coughs> last summer, I um, was walking down the Maple in Birmingham, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, exactly what you're saying, I uh, was surprised um, <laughs> um, painting on the wall. Um, I forgot which one it was, but uh, uh, nonetheless, it was, um, uh, I get it, I, I would love to have this here. Great. And, and I have just one technical question. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming if you put it on the wall of one of our buildings that you restore the wall? Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. Yes. Yeah. Uh, upon removal, we'll fill the hole. So you're going to go into the mortar of the brick, so the brick is behind, and then they fill it with a, a mortar silicone compound, and they, they, they color match it. So after 200 installations over the past few years, we've had no complaints or issues with the remediation. It's been, they're very, uh, the company we contract with is very um, cautious and very careful. For all the freestanding works, we'll contact NIST to make sure there's no utilities running out of it, uh, and then we'll make sure that you know when we're coming out. They'll do the installation in a day, um, and, and they're very careful about, about actually remediating. And we do ensure the space as well. So should there be any damage, we cover um, physical property coverage for that. Thank you. You're welcome. So, anyone else? Uh, we, will, we, would have, we will have one of our building people go with you when you're installing the okay. building so that they can do the system. Sure, sure. <laughs> of course. Why don't you
in a different category of life than... And that's exactly what we're trying to get yeah. past. Yeah, we're yeah. trying to get past that. That's something, as a museum, you know, traditionally have a very elitist... Um, it's for the other people. Yeah, and yeah. it's not. Yeah. It's yeah. not. And, and so we're really trying to, to share. And, and there's so many connections. The DIA has so many connections with Detroit. And we have such a legacy here, you know, the Ford family and the Dodge family. You know, these pieces were, were bought by people who lived here. They weren't just purchased, you know. Sure. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of deep, meaningful things here. And, and, you know, artists were working here because of, because of who was here and who was supporting here. And so we're really trying to branch out to share that with people. Um, and, I, you know, it is important. And we didn't, we didn't expect this program would take off like it did. Again, when I said we did this in, 20, in 2010, it was just to celebrate 125 years. We, we put it out there. We, we used our own funding. We didn't know who, who would enjoy it and who wouldn't. And it, it, as soon as we started installing in September, people just loved it. We thought it was a great program. So we started approaching other um, <coughs> foundations. And so last year, DP Energy funded the program for last year. And then Knight found out about it, and through this Red Max Culture, they gave us another two-year grant. Good. I would love to continue the program forever, replace, you know, change the paintings sure. out. And even though we're using the same works of art, what I find compelling is that you change location every time, so the setting changes, and the context changes, and the feeling of how you do this work of art changes. I mean, I see these pieces every day at work, but when I see them outside, you know, in autumn colors or with the snow or by a barn, I notice things I didn't notice before and it has to be my appreciation of pieces that I didn't actually appreciate either. So it's a great program. Um, so thank you. Thank you for being interested and, and we're very excited again to bring this to you. Um, and if you have any questions, feel free to ask me and enjoy your paintings and your free day and your events. Um, thank you, Michelle. Thanks. I think we're all agree it's a great program. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have a receipt of proposal for cost connection control management services. Yes, after that very professional thank presentation. Thank you. Thank you. That was excellent. <laughs> I'm going to be we're going to be unprofessional now. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to be on for I'm going to be the entertainment. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. No. This is, this is dedicated to Councilman Frazier, but all of Council. I'm going to try to explain the cross connection program. This is going to be. Oh, this won't take long. It's a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. This is, this is industrial art. Sculpture. Yeah. Industrial right. sculpture. There you go. Put that in our gallery. <laughs> so, okay. Now, we've done the cross connection program for a long time, and it's an MDEQ required activity. We've determined that it's uh, definitely more efficient and effective to uh, utilize outside services for this. Uh, the item itself uh, reflects a 22% reduction in cost because of the familiarity and experience of the vendor with the project in general, the MDEQ requirements, as well as our, our requirements and standards of protocol. So what this thing does here <coughs> is it separates clean water from dirty water. How am I doing so far? So far you're doing good. Okay. Now, if, you, if you're a business and you have one of these, that's a good thing. If you don't have one of these, the inspector will say get one mm -hmm. or something like this. Yep. Some device it separates out and keeps the clean water and the dirty water separate. Right? Yep. Now, if you are in a highly specialized area, such as a uh, kidney dialysis function, mm -hmm. you need the best equipment, specifications for that, and you get inspected each year. If you are in a less uh, a less uh, exposed area uh, where it doesn't involve people, up to, up to five years. medical, okay, it's uh, up to every five years. Five years. There's a protocol and a, and a, a, a schedule set up through MDEQ. Now, if you've got one of these on there, that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. Okay, that means it's been inspected. All right? That's the whole program. 
How am I doing? So Expect and certify. So I, I, I want to take a minute. I, I did this for two reasons. One is for entertainment purposes for you guys. <laughs> I, I got an A in physics, but I never learned anything practical <laughs> in, in high school physics. Because it's full stuff. It doesn't have to do with this. This is something like siphoning gas. Same kind of thing. Kind of. Kind of like. This is Larry Searles over here. Larry, stand up, take a bow. Now, Larry is the person in the middle of the night at Hope United Methodist Church when they were under flooded conditions and their good faith plumbing people couldn't quite figure figure it out. Okay, Larry stood out in the middle of the parking lot and said, dig here. And they dug there, and that's where the pipe was first, right? So, therefore, they could go through with the services that they had planned for the next day, which is about the South Field standard that says, go the extra mile and people first. So I want to thank you for that. Great, great. I, I remember the and the next day when you tried to explain it to me. <laughs> <laughs> so this is it. This is my attempt. Mr. Frazier, are we any better off for this effort? Or? Well, uh, <laughs> it looks like Rube Goldberg was there. Uh, <laughs> hey, hey, hey. hey. <laughs> this is That's it. That's the program. Uh, how many businesses we got to inspect each year? 22, uh, this year, 1,200. 1,200 businesses. 1,200 per year the next two years. Yes. 2,400 total. It's on the consent agenda. And so that's the story. They have to sell them every business. Every business. Every business has to have one. It's been the last, last, last probably 15 years. That concludes my office presentation. I just had a good time back then. Basically, yeah. There is no tax to the business or cost to the business right now. It's in the water, the water, in the water and sewer rate right now. Pardon? Just getting out of the question. Okay. Yeah, ma'am. This is just information. Yes, uh, well, it's on the consent agenda. Right, let me see. Yeah, I do have a question that's, uh, I might as well ask it here rather than out at the next meeting because it's on the consent agenda. And that is, <coughs> in the material for the consent agenda, it says that we approved this in 2008. And uh, is this has this been going on since 2008? Because when you read the the background material, it, it implies, or it, I don't know if it's implies or infers, but that this is the first time we've got a contract. No, it's the second time we've got a contract. The first time was 2008. But that's, if you read it, that's not what it says. It says the 2008 council authorized a contract, and three people. Three people bid, and now we're going to award the country. 2008, we we put out the bid. Hydro Design got the contract at that time, and again we put out the bid just this year. So it's been since 2008. Okay, because uh, uh, paragraph two could use a little work. I agree with that. You, 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 can't, you can't quite get there. There's a, there's a missing piece. And there's a legal say the company uh, provided services to a satisfactory level, which they did. Mm -hmm. And it's just stepping around. Correct. You, would, you, 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 can't quite, it, you can't quite get there. Yeah, it takes a leap of faith to get there. <laughs> okay. Well, when I read that, I just thought, wow. Okay. Thanks. Otherwise, yep. you couldn't have a twenty-two percent decrease. Right. Right. He approved it. Yeah. He did improve in two thousand and eight. Yes. Okay. Cost to us. It's cost to us in the water and sewer. One hundred eleven thousand six hundred dollars a year, not to exceed. Right. Yes. Right. clean water, you know. Pardon me. Clean water. That's correct. That's why we have it in there. So it is clean water. Uh, yes, sir. All right, next item is Pawn Shops and Alternative Financial Services discussion with the code. Thank you. If I could just have a minute to so. 
Are you confident? We haven't, through the, through the chair, Mr. Lance, we haven't pinpointed all the types of businesses. That's why there's the professional standard is to call them alternative financial institutions. So they include They could, they, they possibly could be. Okay. We, we want some time to do some further study. We have um, requested information from the National Planning Advisory Service to look at best practices from other communities. We haven't had time to go through all that material yet. Some of these are good, good issues that will come up through the process. So I have a note here to, to look into those as well. Okay, but they do fall into the category of subprime lending, just like the check casting company. Possibly, yes. And they will be looked into in the near, in the near future? We, we will look into that during our process. All right. Yeah, Terry, we talked about it before. Uh, for example, uh, grocery stores uh, do cash checking and uh, take utility bills, and that seems to be coming a regular type of business in the small stores. Uh, how are you going to differentiate between these places that open up to say cash and then they? cash your check or utilities and and they both do the same thing right. and make money the same way but <coughs> they call different things. It could it be divided up into a primary and secondary use of the That's correct. Facility? I think um, in our, our preliminary discussion and, and investigation on the definition uh, we are defining them as primary op operations or what we call storefront operations and that the secondary operation could possibly be limited to a certain percentage of their store, store square footage. And again, those will all come out throughout the process. Right now, we're only recommending storefront primary operations with the moratorium act. We're not looking at um, those that do that as, as a secondary or tertiary business within a grocery store. And that might come out in the recommendations, but uh, the moratorium is for standalone or storefront primary operations. Well, I think I think both have to be controlled. I just want a separation <coughs> of primary and secondary. Another question. So the, 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 the problem that I And 
again, I can't name all of them at this time, but those are, I think we could work through what a similar operation is as a primary function. Okay, similar to one might not be similar to somebody else. I, so I understand that. My friend, uh, uh, Councilman Lance, just brought up uh, one that may have not been even on the list of either, either side because it was kind of like a different kind of a business. Right. Um, there is a provision in the resolution, Mr. Barris helped, helped draft a similar resolution that if a business needs to get relief, they could come and petition to the council that there's a unique circumstance, therefore you would have, there's a, there's a, a relief uh, provision in the resolution that if someone feels that they're unduly being constrained by this moratorium, they can certainly petition the council for consideration. So we feel that with that provision in the uh, resolution that um, we're covering ourselves. Okay, uh, I think I have one other question, two other questions. And that is the, uh, the resolution that's in our, in our package that we're going to act on tonight. Um, should that have, I presume that that's the resolution. Should it have a place at the end where it shows a uh, signature and a date? Because it says, in the, in the body of the resolution, it says 180 days from this date, but there's no place on there to show what date it was through on the resolution I, I, itself. I think we can work with the city clerk's office. The clerk's office would usually yeah, add that at the, at the bottom. They certify. And it would say the date that it was approved mm -hmm. and okay. signed by the clerk. Just to be cranky. Shouldn't that be part of our package? Do you see the actual format yeah. of it? Sure. Okay. Start adding on. Okay. Well, because some of them do. Some of them do have a place for the signature mm -hmm. and the date and all. Okay. And uh, the last point that I'd like to make, it's um, when we see uh, an influx of, of things, and the example that I'm going to use is a proliferate as far as I'm concerned, it's a proliferation of, of pharmacies. All of a sudden, we're seeing them pop up like mushrooms. Uh, I think the council really needs to know that. Um, even though administratively you might be able to uh, approve those, if a lot of them start popping up, uh, something's in the air. And I think the council needs to be aware of, of that. Um, the other you know, the piece of that is nail places. You know, I, you know, I just hate to see us overrun with uh, nail tech places. That you know, every hundred feet there's another nail tech place. Because what that, to me, what that does is it signals what the community is becoming, and I think we need to uh, know that ahead of time. Through the chair, just. We can always do a better job, but we try to monthly put planning activity reports as the blue information sheets, and we list all of the admin, site plans, special use, everything that we're working on. And again, I, I hear you, um, but that's one attempt to at least get that information of what, what's going through our, our offices. Sometimes we're a month behind, but we try to, uh, within a month or two, get you those planning activity reports and, and get those in your packet under, under the blue information sheets. I hear what you're saying. Okay, thanks. That's it. Um, Mr. Lamb? Yeah. Uh, coming back, I think uh, Byron mentioned peers or second peers, or was it? You, all right, somebody mentioned it. So this uh, this big company, <coughs> this big lender, is that a second tier lender, or is he going to be included into the, the first investigation? Through the chair, what we're talking about our primary function is lending. So the storefront, retail storefront, or standalone businesses, that that's what they do and they advertise themselves. Okay. So why can't we include these big corporations that are lenders, subprime lenders too, in the same category and not wait? We, we, we will, um, there, there's a definition about what's regulated by the federal government and we'll use that as our standard to separate between banks and financial institutions that are regulated by the federal government and those that are not. And I cannot answer that question at this time, whether or not the subprime loan. That'll be part of our investigation. Can I suggest that Mr. Lamp forward to Mr. Crow the places for 
particulate that you're concerned with? I can do that. Yeah, I think it would be helpful. We even gave them a tax abatement. <coughs> and, I, and I screamed murder. And I screamed and screamed and nobody <coughs> heard my screams. Wow, that's serious. <coughs> it's more dangerous than the storefront places. Well, all right. I hope it will be included. Okay. I could, uh, I could share um, the 13 businesses that have been identified. Elite Finance, Cash Giant, American General Finance, the Finance America has four locations, Quick Money, Premier Mortgage Funding, Cash in Hand, Check and Go, Cash Advance. Those have been identified as primary standalone or storefront businesses in our community under the alternative financial services. There may be others. This was our initial review. So if you would have additional sites, we'd be happy to look into them. Uh, I was just, you're asking for a 180 day moratorium. What's your timeline kind of moving forward? What, what, what do we see next and when do we see it? Uh, since the department has already started work, we hope within 30 days to have it uh, in front of our planning commission. Planning commission will go through the public hearing process. I believe within 90 days we'll start having something uh, in front of the council, our work studies and workshops. Uh, we may be able to wrap this up within 180 days, but we just, I didn't want to ask for 90 and then come back and ask for additional time. But we're, we're well into this already. Is that it? That's all. Okay. Um, Thank you. It sounds like a reasonable period of time. Next item is an update on special on a special piece of Valley Woods wetlands restoration project. Mr. Harry Carlos and Randy.
on Bell Isle, some other places through the Alliance of Roof Community. So we brought a grant agreement to you in May, at the end of May, and then um, the consultant, uh, environmental consultant in technology, is also the consultant for the Alliance of Roof Communities as well as our consultant, so they prepared the plan. So this is a uh, about three hundred thousand dollars or two hundred and seventy thousand in Southfield of that of that grant to restore this wetland and um, the plan came up so we're we are working on it but it's a zero match except for Brandy and my time and um, the fire marshal's time for for Southfield so payments are all made through the Alliance of Loose Communities. This portion of the project the most effective and efficient way to manage some of these invasive species is through uh, what's called prescribed burn. We have never done a prescribed burn in Southfield. They are done in cities throughout Michigan, so we thought we'd better stop and take a moment. And uh, we've been working with uh, Fire Marshal Jim, Dun Jim Dundas on a permit, but we thought since we've never done anything like this on any of our natural areas, so we better have a discussion about this uh, program. Today we have uh, Gary Crawford, he's a, a senior biologist with Environmental uh, Consulting and Technology, he's going to speak with us, and David Mendel, who's with PlantWise, he's a burn consultant. So this is the type of thing that he does every day. So here's Gary. Thank you for allowing us to have this opportunity this evening. Um, Excuse me, but when you give your name, could you give us the business address because it's just a cousin's record? She's taking uh, yes. secretary. Give us the business address. Your full name and your business address. My name is Gary Crawford. I'm from Environmental Consulting and Technology. Uh, our business address is 2200 Commonwealth Boulevard, Suite 300, Ann Arbor, Michigan, 48105. We also have offices in Clinton Township and uh, Detroit as well. And uh, like I said, I'm, I uh, thank you all, all for allowing us this time to uh, present this project to you. I think what we have here is, a, is, is a, a really good project and, and of high value uh, for the natural ecosystem in Southfield, specifically at the uh, Valley Woods location. What I want to do really quickly is talk to you about the purpose and need for prescribed burns, uh, deal with the pre prescribed burn uh, planning effort that's going on right now, and you all are part of this burn planning effort, and uh, begin to talk about the implementation of prescribed burn. At that time, I'll hand that over to our burn boss, who is here, Dave Mendel, who will be uh, talking about the implementation and uh, giving you some look, a little bit more project information. One of the things that I really wanted to communicate tonight was that uh, prescribed fire is something that, you know, most people think of fire as being something destructive. They think of burning houses and cars on fire or whatever else. Um, but actually, prescribed fire is something that can be very constructive for the natural environment. Um, the uh, indigenous peoples of uh, this state and all over use fire as a way to revitalize natural areas that were uh, being used for agriculture as well as create openings in places that were kind of becoming overgrown by uh, other vegetation that were not desirable for, for some of the game species that they were trying to uh, hunt for. And so uh, we have a quote from uh, someone back in 1834 when he was amazed by some of the large openings and open kind of oak savanna type of habitat uh, inside a township near Dexter. Another thing that prescribed fire is used for is to maintain ecosystem diversity. Here we have a uh, Lake Plain Prairie habitat, which is very susceptible to being overgrown by a large uh, amount of uh, shrubby and woody vegetation. And uh, when, when many early uh, settlers came by and saw some of these <coughs> areas that were open and full of all, all types of diverse uh, plant uh, uh, plant farm. They they had to, they were trying to figure out what is going on with this, but then they begin to see that it's the actual the Native Americans who were kind of helping these ecosystems along by repeatedly burning these ecosystems. And some of the actual plants 
that come up in these Lake Plain Prairie areas actually need fire in order to uh, continue to, to, to be as abundant. In the um, area of Valley Woods, we have two really, uh, what I would call, nasty invasive species. These are plants that just kind of form a, uh, a deep, thick lawn of vegetation that prevents a lot of other types of vegetation from coming forward. Now, diversity is important because there's things like uh, threatened and endangered butterflies, duke skippers, and things like that, which need certain types of vegetation. And if they don't have it, they can't complete their life cycle. And so when you have a monoculture or one type of a certain vegetation, then it eliminates these other plants and things that other wildlife need to live off of. So we have reed canary grass, and this is actually a picture in Valley Woods of just a big dense growth here on your uh, right, or left, maybe your left, my right. And then uh, of Phragmites australis, and I don't know if you've seen Phragmites before, but it is a big problem in the state all over, especially on waterfronts but also in, in wetland areas. Not only does Phragmites outgrow everything, it changes the ability of a wetland to uh, have water in it because it takes up so much water, it can actually dry it out, and by its process of growing and dying, it can lift the floor of the wetland so that it no longer functions as well as a wetland. And those wetland habitats are very, very important when we're trying to restore it. Uh, as you can see, it can restore native plant communities. On, on your left is an example of an area that was overgrown by a lot of vegetation. And once we use prescribed fire to burn that, it uh, began to show these uh, woodland flowers that are rarely seen um, in areas that are, are heavily, uh, have a heavy understory trout lily. Here is another area where you've got a prairie and you've got uh, other types of uh, very, very sensitive um, plants. What we want to do in a prescribed burn, the first thing first is to plan. Uh, and you want to determine what are the goals of your burn. Is it to uh, improve habitat? Is it to uh, restore vegetation? Sometimes people use it on agricultural fields to recondition the soil. So there's many different reasons for it. And uh, so typically we want to create a, a, a burn plan. And I'll kind of go through these different steps here as we move forward. One of the things to do is determine goals, as we said. Some areas where you have a lot of understory vegetation that's not useful for birds and wildlife, then we would prescribe fire to kind of remove <laughs> that wholesale uh, 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 deal with that type of vegetation. Over here on the left at the top, there was a bunch of uh, smaller red maple coming into an oak forest. And you used pre prescribed fire to deal with the smaller red maple, which are not supposed to be in that location. Uh, certain areas, um, we may, we may want to uh, get rid of a lot of the warm season grasses, so some of the wildflowers uh, that are, are useful for our pollinators, bees and things like that, can be established. One of the things that you want to do in a prescribed burn is, is, first of all, indicate what area you're going to burn. And it helps to be able to know what types of uh, things that will serve as containment for your fire. And so uh, we base our burn units which is the area that we're going to burn, on habitat and natural breaks, such as water. Or it can be a change in the type of fuel or vegetation on the, on, on the land. So going from grasses to maybe going into a forested area that has less fuel on the ground in terms of leaves and things like that. Sometimes that can even serve as a break. At other times, we create our own bird breaks uh, by mowing or wetting and things like that. So when we create a burn plan, we want to provide uh, who, who owns the area uh, and make sure all that is in this written documentation that has to be reviewed by the fire marshal and approved. Uh, it outlines the goals of the burn, characteristics of the site, um, establishes who the neighbors are and what the potential smoke concerns are from the burn, uh, weather, pat weather patterns and parameters that would be best for the burn, which way the wind direction is, is uh, what, what, which way is the most positive way for wind direction to occur. Equipment needs and other things. Uh, at this time, I'm going to ask Dave Mendel to kind of come forward because he's going to actually talk about the process of implementing the, uh, the fire. Sure. 
I'm David Mendel with PlantWise LLC, and business address is 224 Charles Street in Ann Arbor, 48103. So Gary's given a great uh, understanding of, of why we're burning and, and the, uh, some of the planning elements that go into it. Uh, one of the key elements, as, as he described, is, is a burn plan, and we've, we've developed a burn plan for the Valley Woods property, uh, and we met last week with, with uh, Fire Marshal Jim Dundas and had a, had a great discussion. And I just wanted to kind of show a little bit of, of you know, this is an example of a burn plan. It doesn't happen to be for Valley Woods, but it gives an, an idea of that there's, we've, we've got a, a map of the site and we're indicating very clearly what the burn boundaries are, how, how that burn unit is delineated. We're also kind of looking at, uh, as, as Gary mentioned, what the weather parameters are, what's the ideal wind, humidity, temperature conditions, and, uh, and, and what our emergency contact information is. I mentioned we had a, we had a good discussion with the fire marshal. Uh, and we're going to continue to talk with him about the final, the final elements that are needed for securing the permit. And it, I, I, I should add uh, <coughs> that in this portion of Michigan, uh, the local fire department is, is the body that, that can, uh, does the permitting process. In other portions of the state, the Michigan Department of Natural Resources and even the DEQ, the Department of Environmental <coughs> Quality, also can weigh in on, on issuing permits, but here in, in Southfield, uh, it is it is the uh, the local fire department. One of the really key elements in conducting the burn is to is to really make sure that the, the smoke, which is going to be the most visible element for uh, for residents in the area, that the smoke is going where we want it to go. Um, we've got uh, telegraph immediately to the east. Um, we've got 10 miles to the south, and so we're, we're looking for conditions that are going to take the smoke primarily back into existing natural areas, and as the smoke lifts, uh, it'll, it'll be you know, well above uh, the height of, of houses and residences. Um, and and you, you can see uh, the photo on the, on the right is a good example of kind of atmospheric conditions which allow rapid smoke rising, and that's what we're looking for in, in, a, in a case like this. In addition, um, in, our, in our discussion with the fire marshal, we talked about really trying to target a, a weekend for, for burning, again, to kind of minimize the amount of traffic that's going to be exposed to the burn uh, on, the, on the day that the burn takes place. We'll do this burn with, with um, probably five people on site, and we get together uh, prior to, to <coughs> lighting, and we discuss in detail kind of the, the parameters of the unit, how we're going to go about ignition, uh, and everybody has a role. Everybody understands whether they're igniting, whether they're helping to suppress the fire, control the, the fire lines. Um, you'll see also that we we're all equipped with uh, personal protective equipment, so it's all fire retardant clothing, hard hats with face shields, gloves, boots. Everybody has a two-way radio, so we're able to be in touch with each other at all times throughout the burn. And then we're ready to start the we're start ready to start the fire. Gary described how we use changes in vegetation, or we create our own breaks. And one of the things that we that we start to do at the at the beginning of the burn is to use fire to widen those downwind burn breaks. So in this case, we're we're starting all the way at the uh, well with Valley Woods. What we would be doing is we, we're looking for winds that are out of the northeast. And that's going to kind of continue to push the, the smoke away from Telegraph, which is kind of the biggest, the biggest concern that we've identified. So we're going to start the burn all the way at the southwest corner of the burn unit, the downwind most area, and we're going to let the fire kind of creep back slowly into the wind. And in that way, we're able to control it in the, in the uh, easiest way possible. And that's called a back burn. Um, again, we're just we're letting the fire fight its way back into the wind. There are portions in, of the burn, um, as Gary mentioned, there's, there's heavy, 
heavy loads of reed canary grass and, and Phragmites, and for really short periods of time, we'll probably have much, much larger flames, and in particular when, when a fire is, is in the Phragmites, that Phragmites has a lot of oil in the, in the stems, and anytime vegetation is, uh, is burning that, that contains a lot of oil, it produces darker, blacker smoke. And so we would have very brief periods, and, and I'm thinking in the, in the probably around five minutes, five to ten minute period, where we would have kind of denser smoke. Again, that's moving yeah. in the direction that we're that we're anticipating. So just to just to give a sense, um, we'd again be, be looking for winds that are that are out of the northeast, which are carrying the the uh, smoke back down into a, another natural area, so that we're, we're minimizing the disturbance. You can see the, the lighter colored areas in through here behind the, the, the hatching is all the, the reed canary grass and the grass and types of vegetation. <coughs> the, the, the darker green is, is, uh, is obviously the trees and it's primarily floodplain forest. And one of the characteristics of floodplain forest is that there's, there's not very much <coughs> fuel, vertical material on the ground in those areas because it's so wet and things uh, decompose very quickly. So that's one of these types of, of, uh, of fuel transitions that we're using as, as our burn break in, uh, in, a, in a large portion of the site. And of course the Rouge River is, is running uh, right through this area as well. David, can you mention the height difference between Denso and, and, and the floodplain? Yeah, the so, so on the, on the immediate mm -hmm. west edge of the, of the burn unit mm -hmm. is a, a very steep uh, wood that ri runs up Probably about uh, it's probably about a 40 foot elevation change between the bottom of the of the wetland and the top of the oak, uh, <coughs> oak forest where where the dendro buildings are are contained. Um, and what we'll do is we're gonna our our burn unit will stop right at the base of the hill. And again, there's another transition in vegetation there. So we're going from uh, we're going from the reed canary grass and phragmites that's contained in the, in the wetlands to uh, predominantly oak leaves that are on the slope. And there's, in, in most of those areas, there is mucky soil. It's just bare soil where the fire can't, can't cross. In some areas, those two types of vegetation, the grassy vegetation and the, and the oak leaf litter come together. And in, in those places, we'll take leaf blowers and we'll kind of create our own burn break. We're, we'll create our own separation in the, in the types of fuel that we've been burning, so the fire the fire is not gonna is not gonna be burning up up the slope through the woods towards uh, towards the Denver building. So again, floodplain forest surrounding east and south side, woods on the north and west side, and uh, it's just the wetland, just those the low lying areas that we would be. These are, these are uh, actual shots of, of Valley Wood, uh, the wetland here. And you can see that in the, in the distance is that floodplain forest. And it's coming out. As, as we move out, we're seeing uh, some of this reed canary grass uh, that Gary mentioned earlier. And you can see how it's forming this monoculture. It's really kind of driving out any kind of species diversity. Um, and then the, the really tall vegetation in the back. Uh, left is the, the Phragmites, and that's, that's you know, 10 feet tall, 9, 10 feet tall. Um, you can also see that, that uh, it's, it looks dead in this image, and that's because uh, it's been treated with, with, uh, with herbicide as well. So that now we're going to burn, burn off that dead thatch, and the idea is that that's going to allow uh, a lot of the native vegetation to, to emerge. I just want to make one comment because on the picture that we're looking at right now it's green and actually it's almost it's so light it's almost almost white it's so because of the eight, because of the type of weather we've been through so it's not oh right now it's all yeah, yeah it's all, yeah, yeah, white it's all very dry and very that like pale yellow that's and, summer. And, and, and that's yeah, it's a great point that's that um, the greenness or a lack of greenness in the vegetation is one of the major determinants of the timing right. of the burn itself. 
if we were to if we were to burn the site at a time when it's this green, it would produce a huge amount of smoke. And it would probably even be difficult for the fire to carry through there because it would be trying to, to uh, it, it's working against so much moisture in the vegetation. And so what we what we're looking to do is burn while uh, while these types of plants are still in their dormant state, while they're essentially you know the, the dead batch material. It looks and a lot so like it looks a lot like dried wheat in this comparison. It's not seen. Yes, yes, that's okay. exactly right. Got one more slide. So, and so we're looking at, at kind of that, that period where the vegetation is in, a, in this dormant space. And, and so it would be sometime between uh, now, a couple weeks from now, and, and uh, April. Um, it's all weather dependent. When we're burning, because, because we live in Michigan and it's the whole, you know, if you don't like the weather, wait for, for 10 minutes, mm -hmm. um, we typically can't predict very accurately what the winds and humidity and temperature are going to be like more than about a day or two ahead of time. And so it tends to be this situation where on Thursday we're, you know, I'm looking at all the weather forecasts and see that Saturday or Sunday is looking like it's going to be really good weather. And then we start to notice the issue process. Uh, say, okay, Saturday is looking like, like it's going to be a good burn day. Um, the actual burn itself is it's a pretty fast process. We're going to be covering about five and a half or six acres, and that'll take uh, probably less than two hours of actual fire on the ground. It's it, you know it smells like a like a campfire, and it's it's a it's that type of a of an experience. Okay, you have my question. I just wanted yeah. David to mention a little bit about yourself and how many fires you started and. I started when I was about four, <laughs> and, and most of those, you know, the first five years, I didn't put them out as much as I started them. Um, I've, I've done about 550 or, or 600 prescribed burns, covering about 6,000 acres throughout the state. Um, I've got a great uh, liability, general liability policy, and I, I've never had a, a claim on that policy. Um, we've never had an incident where we've had to contact the fire department for any kind of backup. So we've always kept the fire where we expected the fire to be. And other communities that use prescribed burns? We've been doing burns in Detroit, uh, in uh, the Rochester area, Oakland Township, burning throughout uh, the metro parks. Um, City of Ann Arbor, Cedar <coughs> Rapids, Holland, Kalamazoo, um, hundreds, of little, probably literally hundreds of different communities around the state, including many in, in urban areas and, and throughout Southeast Monroe, City of Monroe. Okay, we have a few questions, Mr. Lane, and then um, Okay. The, the primary object. The, uh, the objective is to create a wetland. To restore a more native habitat in the wetlands and also and wetlands. Uh, part of the work that's not being done by David is there's some channels that were built in the, I don't know, the 60s or something to drain it. Um, so we'll be filling those back in so it's going to okay. retain more water during okay. storm events. I have some more questions. Isn't there another way of doing this project and not using the burn method? There I is. think there is. Now let me tell you what I think. All the brush and all that the vegetation can be cut and tilled into the ground. And wait till it becomes compost for a short time. Now when you burn an area you're not burning the roots. They don't come down to the roots. It just burns the top vegetation and top shrubs and all that. So those roots come up again. Okay? I know they do. So why not another method of cutting and tilling? There will be no pollution, no smoke, no smell, no danger talk about the climate and the pictures you have and 
and your your record of no fires and the insurance is an okay. That's not the only method you can use in doing this job. I believe, or yeah. what I think. I think it's uh, probably more efficient, but I'm going to defer to some of the biologists here. You're exactly right. That that fire alone is not is not the yeah. way of eliminating. The, the I'm not a biologist, the but I know. I know a little bit. Yes. Yeah that it doesn't burn the roots. You don't have to be a biologist to know that it doesn't burn the roots, and there's a better way of restoring the land to a wetland or a habitat or anything else. And when you do that, you plant your own desired plants in brush and everything. So it may not, it may not be the fastest way, but it's the safest way and the best way of restoring the wetlands, I believe. So why not let's think about another method instead of burning. I think burning is, is causes a lot of pollution, black smoke, white smoke, unnecessary. <coughs> our land, our air is polluted as it is. Well, I think a thought, a thought. You're a, you're a landscape engineer, you know. Yeah, there's different ways to do different things. Yeah. I think that there's some benefits to doing it this way in terms of bringing on some Is of the there other... there more benefits doing it the other way, the clean way? I think that, you, especially in a wetland, you might be getting into more soil disturbance and compaction, and it'll be, you know, a, not in not that impacting. kind of wet area. If, if, you, if you cut it down to the roots, down to the earth, and then you till it. I'm not I talking about a garden fill. I'm talking about a big thing that the farmers use. Yeah, down in the wetlands, they're, yeah. they're, they're not probably the going to permit that. You, you can't it. till in a wetland. Who's not going to permit the, the, state, the state. state? The state of Michigan would require. Uh, <coughs> they're going to permit the burning instead the of. The state of Michigan does not permit to burn. The local fire marshal permits to burn. They because they does use. Does it have to be burned? They or the suggestion that I made is that a proper way to also to till to cut and till to cut and till what you'll end up doing I'll uh, Gary will explain this in more detail what do you end up you'll end up you'll still deal with the roots and it's part of the root system no you don't let me finish it's part of the root system you are also doing spot treatment on any of the stuff that potentially comes back well you're what ending up with all the roots burning it no. what the it burning does burning the root the root reed canary grass has very shallow roots so that the burn actually affects the, the top portion of it. And since the, the mass is gone, you're able to plant your new material in there, which then takes root and pushes out. And that prevents the, the previous roots from coming up. It doesn't, it, doesn't, uh, uh, it doesn't totally. So what you end up doing is coming back and doing spot treatment. I don't on believe the, that. A little bit. <laughs> I don't believe that. You're the expert. I'm. I'm yeah. the reader and you're the expert. Correct. Okay. okay. No, I don't. We wouldn't that. be able to do your Mary, method. Mary, who's yes. the show that we should speak on that? Oh, I'm sorry, is this John O'Mara? Yeah. He's our from, from uh, environmental consultant and technology. About what I suggest you think. Same as Gary. Okay. ECT. Okay. Oh, I okay. ECT. I know that. Yes. The 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 method that we are that we're doing is a method that's proven to work in areas where we have large monocultures of things like Phragmites and Reganary grass. And the restoration of St. John's Marsh uh, in Sterling State Park in different areas, even in areas where we've got lots of buckthorn and things like that, it's a preferred method. Because one of the things that it does, even though you may be able to till this stuff back into the ground, there are certain things like Phragmites which produces a chemical called gallic acid which actually prevents other plants from being established by conditioning the soil. Wait a minute, you're going to put a, a chemical in there also no. and burn? No, no, it comes from the plant. It comes from the plant itself. Phragmite is the reason why it's so, and, and even reconary grass, the reason why they're so able to colonize these areas is because not only do they stop the other plants no, by growing no. over, but they also release chemicals into the ground that prevent other plants from being established. 
That's a two-part <coughs> process. You have to you have to prove that to me that the chemicals in the plants will prevent other plants from growing. I can send you I can send you a technical report. You have to prove that. It's to called me. It's called well, I work the garden here in the city, and mm -hmm. we till it, and we we till it into the garden, the compost, and then we plant, and none of that ever comes up. I don't believe that. Have you ever? Have you ever and tried a small garden? That's a forty-foot garden. Have you ever tried the garden underneath a walnut tree? Mm -hmm. The garden under what? The black have you ever walnut. tried the walnut uh, uh, garden under a walnut tree? Exactly. A black walnut tree. You can't. There's ten yeah. again. Yeah. Same thing with pine trees. So pine, yeah. How many put, trees are you going to cut down to restore? How many trees are you going to cut down to restore the wetlands? Whatever you want to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, there's an open meadow that we can cut down and put in there. Well, don't forget trees. There's no trees there. I'm saying that. I'm saying the mechanism is the same. The mechanism is the same that makes a black walnut preserve its area. So that it doesn't have other kinds. No, I'm saying it's, I'm saying that the mechanism is the same. I'm, the same way that a black walnut controls its area is the same way that Phragmites controls its area. Mm -hmm. It's the same method. Come on. I'm, I'm agreeing with him, Sid. I don't I don't agree with that. I I agree. I I think. Well, I'm thinking. Okay, you don't get thinking <laughs> too often. <laughs> And I, you know, and I, think I'm, I think I'm correct because burning is is dangerous. Number one, the pollution and a lot of harm to it. I'm, 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 I'm trying to suggest a another way of doing it. There in must be another way of doing it. In this area, it would be very difficult to till that all up. The DEQ and DNR would not allow us to go in there and disturb all that soil and loosen it. Oh, come like on. I don't believe that. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah sure that large that area. That. No. Because then you have a, you're going to have a <laughs> rain event. you got to give me that in writing. That, that they don't... That that what you're telling me is what they believe. If you saw this is I want to see seven that acre in the area guidelines that we're not going to till. Preparing the earth for to transfer it to, to a wetlands or a different habitat. Well, can you send you some information about prescribed burns? I don't think I have any examples of filling. Why don't you laugh more? You laugh a little louder, Myron Fraser. Laugh a little louder. Said, why should I? You cover your Wait. eyes and you look at him and he's laughing. You're both joking. Well, I'm not joking. Neither am I. No. So you don't even know what I said. I, so. didn't hear, I don't have to hear what you said. Well, of course You not. said something to him and he started to laugh. All right. All right. That's, that's besides the point. Wait a minute. Said, like Mary said, under certain areas, the DEQ will not let you go in there and tell. Okay? Oh, all right. It doesn't I mean, matter. We can get I said my words. I understand okay. what you're saying, but... We can get information that says you should not go in there and till certain areas. There are certain areas where you can't, can't you cannot that. go in there and touch. I can't believe that. The DEQ is very, they have certain guidelines, and you cannot go against their guidelines. I've got to see it. That okay. They, that they don't allow. I have property of north. Of I can't do certain things on my property that I own. I, you don't, I don't want to, I don't want to hear that. Thing. It's the I same thing. I want to hear. I want to hear what that agency is trying to tell us that we're not allowed to do that. They're telling you can't till in that area. Oh, you cannot till in certain areas. Baloney. No, it said whatever you want to think. The city of Southfield is not the, the, the get everything here. MDEQ does have regulations. And you cannot go out there and do that kind you of thing. You have to show me that they, they don't allow tilling the soil. Can we get that from somebody? All right. Yeah, we'll get that. Yeah, no. Right. 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 And we'll give Mary between Mary and before Brandy before they contract, before they contract the burnout. Burn yes, we'll get that information to All you. Right. Okay. okay. All okay. right. And you'll find another way of doing it. it, it if if there's a, another way, we'll look at it. Okay. Okay. That's what I'm asking you. All right. Okay. 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 Mr. Um, I have two questions. Um, 
Are you going to, um, uh, I heard you allude to something, uh, are you going to be doing, after the burn, uh, do you want to do planting so mm -hmm. to encourage? Yeah, we're going to bring in native plants and seeds okay. and we seed that area. Yeah, you just seed and plug, right? Yeah, plug. What size? What are we getting in there exactly? The you, you currently, as of, I think, I think as of November, on your November council meeting, you had a uh, contract that you awarded for that activity, which is um, mm -hmm. going to be the plant and the seed and the restoration after the burn occurs okay. uh, in there. So that. They'll bring in the native plants and the plug size, which will, is kind of already the pre-started <coughs> seed, and then they'll also seed over the area to pro provide additional um, uh, spacing uh, for the vegetation, and then that will start taking root. And any little uh, invasive that, because of the roots um, that may still be in the area, they will uh, treat um, and take out one more time. With, with, with the wick? With a WIC application, which basically means they're walking around with a little paintbrush and they paint the leaves as they come up. <coughs> All that acreage, they're going to go around and that's, you know, that's that's put the chemical on each one? Well, that's why after the after I using burn. the burn mechanism, if you use the burn mechanism, you only have a few of those that come up. If you go and using your methodology, if you use that methodology to go till and turn all that acreage under, you're looking at probably 10 to 15 times the cost of what a burn would be. Well, how and about forest fires? Forestry uses this. The whole yep. area burns down, and then in a year or so, everything comes up again in the blush. Not they don't have to put seeds down or anything. A lot of their seed, native seeds, still would still be, would even be there. here, will be their in the soil. Their own seeds re regrow. Yeah, the na the yeah. native seeds so in the soil. The native seeds in the soil. No, no, right. Um, thank you for mentioning that because I didn't connect the dots between the earlier thing and, and this. In that contract. Uh, but uh, another question for you. Um, uh, to the immediate west of uh, this site is a, a large condo complex. How? Um, I don't doubt your expertise in controlling the fire, um, but. Uh, Anytime there's smoke, there's people going to start calling, uh, 911, all of that kind of thing. So how are uh, how is this going to be communicated to the residents? Especially, uh, and the other thing I'm thinking of, um, with my public school background, um, there are a lot of kids today with asthma, and that wouldn't want necessarily be outside if the wind should blow uh, towards uh, the condo complex. So, uh, what is how, how does the notification? Well, we're working with our Marshal Jim, but we've also met with the Condo Association right. board okay. and um, explained the whole project with them, uh, so they're aware that it's coming. You know, but uh, and when we get closer, we'll you know be notifying them again. You know that it's coming up. So how does that the the Condo Association coming over there. Okay. Well, they they look at the weather conditions the that day, just like when we had the, the the burn at you know we burned the house down with the fire training. They they did it at a certain time so that the smoke would go straight up when at Carpenter Lake when we did the fire training on the, the house. This is the condo association here. The one thing as Mary mentioned, we've met with them a couple of times. They've uh, provided a letter to the city that said anything you do on your property, you're more than welcome to do on ours. <coughs> including doing the burn, so they were aware of it, and they will be, you know, discussed be yeah, beforehand. Because they actually own, if you saw property lines on here, they own like this little yep. piece That's of right. it. So, in order to go do it on their property, you know, you want to make sure you had authorization. And Dave said that. Yeah, again, as Dave said, the best way to do it is with the northeast wind, which keeps it since this is a third, uh, 40 foot raised uh, valley keeps that smoke kind of down in the valley as it's coming through here, um, and which is part of the reason the uh, short notice on the window of notification, um, which is we've talked with Jim about and he's aware, you know, it's like if the weather conditions, the humidity, the wind direction, everything's right, we're going to go. If it isn't, if it's coming out of the east, no, you don't want it because, again, you have that, the residents and stuff up here. 
So that's part of the planning process is making sure that you hit those weather conditions right. Well, I'm, I'm glad I asked the question and uh, figured that you would have already thought of that, but um, didn't know um, what, how you're going to do this. But uh, thank you. Well, we're also preparing. We're going to have a press release that we'll send out the uh, day before the burn or the morning of okay. the And the stuff of sun's here. My point is that there's a time frame this is going to happen. So when right. people, I think the broader uh, community would like to know. And know the end. Yeah, absolutely. Obviously, noticing that you know, in Southfield has some of the local regional TV stations. Obviously, um, that was part of the reason that dealing with the press releases because. Um, you, know, you can watch the news a lot of times, and they are reporting live from South Hill looking over the overpass as well. Right. You know, they you can want to make sure the they can also make announcements that would help people not 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 call the fire department and correct. Yeah. 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 So we'll also put we'll, we'll put large, uh, you know, the DOT orange signs out on the overpass road as well to say prescribed burn ahead. <coughs> people driving will have a chance. Okay, Mr. Moore. Uh, yeah. So this is obviously the outlined area of where the the burn will take place. Is there a deviation? I mean, do you how tight can you make that to make sure it stays in that area? Um, is there you know, room for error and things like that? Or I'm certainly not going to be riding my bike next to like the people on the picture board. <laughs> yeah. So so this <laughs> 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 looking at that picture, thinking those people it's are old. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it gives you a sense of of, of how. It, in that in that instance, the, the flame height where you know was about a foot and a half, yeah. a foot and a half tall, and you could see how controlled the, the smoke was. This this area is really uh, pretty devoid of, 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 of burnable fuel. And what we'll do is we'll have uh, we'll have a backup uh, a backup line on the on the slope itself. Okay. We'll also um, we have pit pumps and hose and hundreds and hundreds of feet of hose, and we'll put a we'll put a pump down at, at the river and run hose. Around, around the unit. It's pretty strictly vague. I mean, that's that's not yeah. a suggested area. That's exactly that's fine. Exactly right. How close have you done it before in close to other buildings? I know that you said there's a 40 foot drop off, but how close in general have you done it? Okay. We've done that. We've done burns within about uh, five, five feet. Five feet. Wow. Yeah. It, it depends on what the building is. You know, if, uh, with with brick buildings, we've gotten closer, uh, and again, we're we're doing it. At very aware of what the okay. what the wind is doing. Um, wow! Yeah. Right this is the Ann Arbor YMCA, um, and they've got this native vegetation that, that uh, you know it that's goes pretty much landscape. right up to them. That's their landscape. Is that in town? Yes, right in mm -hmm. the center of Ann Arbor. And this this is uh, this is if, if people know Ann Arbor at all, this is uh, Huron Road is mm -hmm. running right by, which is about the, the main east west mm -hmm. of there. And you said it would be an hour, hour and a half? Yep, that's about right. What is the timeline, Mary? What is the timeline when all this is going to take place? It's going to occur sometime, you know, after the permit is released, uh, between April and April and March. Okay. And the notification, um, when we send a press release, it is a fairly short, like, 24 to 48 hours before because they have to wait for the, you know, the, the wind conditions. Perfect conditions. I'd like to condition. see the, the official paperwork on the on the guidelines of preparing all this. Preparing all this? Yeah. Is it your our burn application? Yeah. yeah. All that. Mm -hmm. I want to see all that. All right. You know, the federal government that I don't this in, in, in national parks. I was in Yosemite last summer, and they have prescribed burn going. I mean, it's I'm not talking about the prescribed burn. The, mm -hmm. They do a lot of it. I'm talking about the 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 uh, the earth. What happens to us when it burns like that, or if there's another okay. type of method to do it? That's what I want to find out. All right, we we said we I get that. I believe there is. We said we get that to you. I want to see all that. All right. Not that I can stop this. It's about a six to one all the time. But but we I still like you, sir. We still like you. Okay. Um, well, we'll do what we can do. Anyone else? Because I have a couple things I want to ask. Anyone else? Um, first of 
Well, in terms of a burn, everything doesn't get burned all at once, does it? I mean, you, you don't, when I looked at the plan, I looked at the plan, and you burn certain segments and then you, you, um, it's going to be between right. one right. and one and a half hours. If, if you're burning it as you go, right. and then you're, you're, you're dousing it or you're playing the fire off, so you don't have everything out of control. And all those fire lines, those brake lines, which I, I understand it. I'm, I mean, I'm sorry some people don't. But my, I have a, right, that's a, that's a very good description of the I was at the site, and I, I have to explain to people, I was, burns are, burns are very popular with, prairie people and plant people. Um, a lot of my environmental friends, and I'm one of them, but I'm not an expert on this, have very, uh, it's controversial, burns are controversial in, with some, uh, I'd say quite a few environmental groups because of the species that are sometimes displaced. I mean, you've obviously been doing this a lot and you have a lot of knowledge about it, and I'm glad to hear that you're concerned about the species in there. Personally, I would like to see this done like right away while it's cold because in March when it starts to get warm and the frogs are shedding out of the ground and the turtles especially coming out of the ground, that's, that's a concern to me because that's part of what we're doing normally. But I went down with Mary and with Randy um, about a little over a week ago and saw how bad it really is. I mean, it's, it's not the kind of thing you can go pull out. It's so thick. It's so matted in there. And if you took heavy equipment in there, you would be compacting the, the soil because it's wet. It's all wet, whether it's in the in the actual river channel or not. So I have to say, and I don't, you know, I have to be convinced, and I, I'm really a skeptic. I, I'm convinced that this is the only choice that you have, um, given all the circumstances. And I'm comfortable in saying that I'm, I can I can say, you know, you have my um, approval in the sense of I'm comfortable <coughs> that it's the right thing to do. So I, I wanted to say that because it was, I have experts in, in the group that I belong to who do burns and know about burns and have expressed a lot of concerns to me about what 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 the factors are. Sometimes it's phragmites that can actually make them stronger. Some of these things through burns can become stronger and come back and become stronger. So I know what you're you know what you're doing and you're following the NDC um, guidelines. So I, I see no other way to do this to be honest with you. I I I'm comfortable with it. Okay. Uh, president, there's uh, an expert. I'm an expert too in common sense. Okay. I think I think this is not the method. I think there's a better method. That's what I believe, and that's what I'm going to find out. That's what we told you we would do. We'll, we'll give you the information. Okay. Your point. Just so you know, and the point of what you're, you all are saying is you work at, you use different <coughs> methods and try to use the best combination of all those methods. And part of what you're saying as far as, you know, is there other ways? Yes, you could come in and dump chemicals all over this. And I didn't that, talk about no, chemicals. No, no, I, what I, I understand. What I'm saying is you use those tools that you have in your toolbox and you may end up using more than one meaning prescribed burn in this instance lessens the thickness of what that's there. Then you can come in and do some of the other activities as well because you now don't, in this instance, don't have all that thick grass that even if you tilled it under, you've now created a mat down in that system that absorbs the soil and the water within that so that you've now raised that elevation in the wetlands, which actually we're trying to lower so we get it wetter, but you're right. So in some instances, in some of these other areas, like Mary said, there are some areas where we are actually, as part of this overall project, coming in and using other methodologies, i.e. where some of the Phragmites are, because Phragmites roots can go down upwards of four feet, where those tall strands are, we're actually coming in, the contract that you let out is one where they are excavating four feet of, uh, of material out because we recognize that in the big fragmites, the ones that are uh, 10 to 12 foot tall right now, burning isn't going to even affect them. It'll get rid of the mass, but that root system that you talked about is there four feet down. So what are we going to do? Part of the 
contract that's going out there, they're out there digging those roots out, and those roots are being taken to the landfill. They're not being taken to you know some park someplace else. And they're not being filled into the soil. And they're not being filled in because, because the roots. There was a meadow there and those trees, a very mm -hmm. sparsely tree. Yeah, on the outside. Yeah, the open area that you saw, <coughs> find it here. <coughs> this <coughs> is all open. Okay, so there's no trees there, and you don't have deep, deep roots. Then. Fragmites have roots. Head fragmites have roots three to four feet deep. So if you have strands up here, you got strands over here, and this is a fragmite strand down here. So what is being done right now? There's a you have a contractor in place who's out there. I don't know if he was out working that day. You're out there. But he's out there digging these areas out, creating more open water in those in addition, but he's getting rid of those big, deep, phragmites roots. The reed canary grass doesn't have four foot deep roots, so the burn affects the top inch or so of the root system itself, and by getting rid of that heavy thatch that you saw that one picture, how thick it is, by putting in the other plants and stuff, it allows those plants to then start elbowing, in essence, out the freight or the reed canary grass, and as they, they've established, because you put plugs in, you come back using the mixed tool bag, you come back with the wick system for any of those little invasives to come in. Now you don't have to go use chemicals on this whole thing. You can come back and use chemicals on a few plants, like walking around and basically painting that one, coming over and painting that one. So I agree with you. You don't go and use one methodology when you go do something. You use all the, the things that are in your toolbox. Well, you didn't say that before. But I still That's don't why believe, I hired them. I don't believe that the burning is the main method. Okay. Well, between okay, the burning you. and the excavation, Sid, that will take care of it. Mr. That's Mr. what we're saying. With a little bit of, of I the... I want to see the oh, guidelines okay. from, the right. eight, from the state or federal agency. We'll, we'll, I, and I said, we'll get okay. that for you, okay? And we'll get to all the council members. Yeah, well, uh, I, I understand he had information requested. When should we expect to see this again? Because if you're looking at a March, Brandy? as early as March. Mary? Technically, we're going to, you know, we're, it was more informational. Oh, than that. yeah, th th there's no council action okay. required. required. But I would say probably within the next few weeks or so, we can get that information oh, to yeah. you guys. Yeah. We're, we're not about to have a large next fire. Without right. Your it's your not your without you guys knowing, yeah. okay? Yeah. I appreciate Especially that. Especially since. <laughs> we have never issued a permit like this. We never had one before. Never had one. So, so people have to understand. The and again, Mr. Dundas is not going to let us burn anything until it's perfect conditions. Speak okay. Speaking of you know, a toolbox, uh, uh, it's one tool we need to be able to explain this thing in one sentence to someone who calls. Yeah. If you get a call, okay, first we'd say, we calm them down and say, this is, you know, control. We know about it. explain mm -hmm. this. Okay, what is the public benefit of this entire project? Okay, when you read the item, you get it, it has to do with clean water and mm -hmm. and better, I guess, control of of uh, okay. rainwater or restoring a wetland, restoring a wetland, stormwater management, and and wildlife habitat. Mm -hmm. That's the sentence. Yeah. Okay. Part of the whole, whole part of the Great Lakes. Yep, we're a clean small water. part of a larger okay. project. All right. all this contributes to clean water. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, I, need to hear. Okay. Yep. I I just I really hope no. that the weather conditions are such that you can do this sooner rather than later. Because yes, and we do too. To the I'll give you a similar example of you just said. The hospitals and the patients in the hospital. The hospital is there, so the patients die sometimes. So you're saying there's going to be clean water after that and, and birds. And what we're saying is we're trying we're trying to clean up the river. Okay, we're not going to say it's going to be completely clean. Said we're saying it's going to be. I'm just talking about different methods. Okay, I'm just yeah. saying too though. That, you know, it's not going to be perfect. We know it's not going to be perfect. And those people that are going to get the the smoke and the they're going to get it. They're going to complain plenty. And that's why we have Mr. Dundas here, and he's going to tell us exactly he's when. Not, he's going to be Moses and God. No. He's not going to be Moses, but he's going to tell us. He's going to tell us when our best time is to burn this. Okay, that's that's kind of what his job is. Yeah. Put, put Sydney's telephone number uh, on there. Jim's <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, done a lot of due diligence yeah. on this, so I think they need to hear from him. Are you going to have a pumper on standby? 
Chief Dundas, uh, <coughs> Heck and Chief and Fire Marshal. Um, one of the things that was said is that we've never had a permit like this before, and that's because I'm in the fire prevention business, and we typically don't allow that anywhere in South Hill for anything to be burned. If someone wants to burn these in the yard, we don't allow that. It does, however, fit within the fire code, and there's a permit process for that. Um, the, the permit that we're going to issue for this, uh, should everything fall into place, um, How do you know you're going to issue a permit already? That's why I said if everything falls into place. Right. I'm making that again, this is not the kind of thing that I immediately jumped up and said, this is a good idea to burn this. I wanted to understand it. I did a lot of research on it. I've uh, taken these folks uh, from uh, ECT and PlantWise to the Ringer. They've proven to me that they have a very safe procedure for this. Uh, when I talked to Dave Mendel, I asked him, uh, had he ever had a fire that got away from him? And he said, not in the, what, 15 years that you've been doing it, Dave, though, he said. And I can surely guarantee that there won't be one on my watch either. We'll make sure that all the safety precautions are in place. Um, if we issue a permit, uh, Mr. Lance, uh, the, the, the cost of the permit will cover any potential overtime costs that we may have as well. Um, I have researched the process. Uh, they did uh, 26 of these type of burns in Ann Arbor last year. I talked to the fire marshal in Ann Arbor, and um, she was willing to um, advocate for the process and for this particular company. And that they are very sharp guys and know what they're doing. And I believe <coughs> well, if there's any questions of me, I'll be at the answer. Yeah. Jim, if you had to access the site, how would you do it? Uh, there's a very limited access here. Okay. Um, if, there, if, if the worst thing could possibly happen where it, it, the fire got away from them in some way, which, again, I can almost guarantee that's not going to happen, the job of the fire department would be basically to check, protect the exposures of the buildings in relationship to the woodland. So, um, on, you know, on the back side here, we'd be looking at the Denzo property here. There is a parking lot there with some very limited access to it. If we were going to put water on it, it would be with a master stream device or a you know, a water can uh, from some distance well, We have away. an access drive that comes in right off of what the, what the Tinsley Drive, the construction yeah, type of Yeah, and, it, and the, the weight of our trucks would probably not allow us to go to the into that, uh, the, the softer area there. Uh, the same is true with behind Meriwether. So here's a parking lot that gives us some access to the back side. Mm -hmm. But we would mostly be lobbing mm -hmm. water in the distance mm -hmm. and protecting the explosion. And if you needed to get in there, we would be there with equipment to help you get out if you had to. Right, and, uh, <laughs> right uh, and Mr. Mandel is bringing his own water, uh, his own pumps, his own people that are trained in extinguishing fires. They also keep a certain amount of water on their back for mm -hmm. burning things. Should something go in the wrong direction or a wind change, they're prepared to deal with it. All right, thank you very much. I have a question. Um, how long is the burn? How long does the burn last? Uh, between an hour and an hour and a half. How long will the smoke smoke um, be present? Um, I'm assuming it's the same time period. Yeah, it, it'll it'll typically linger maybe for another hour after after the all the fire and smoke have, have dissipated. And a part of the permit, some of the conditions of the permit uh, would be that there would be people there on site after the fire is out to make sure that there's no rekindling or any uh, unfortunate <coughs> fires. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Thank you.